Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Regular viewers might note that I am using a different microphone. There's a reason behind that. Uh, some of the recording equipment currently is at Amy's house, and she has just come down with a chest infection, so I don't want to risk the plague and picking it up. So I'm using a spare microphone, so the audio quality is going to be a little worse. But in this particular video, we're going to be starting things out with Microsoft and Windows 10 on ARM because there are actually some restrictions on the operating system running on ARM that had not been originally disclosed. Then we're going to move over to the Ryzen V1000 SOC, which is aiming squarely at Intel's Gemini Lake. And then we're going to finish the video with some benchmarks for the Ryzen 2600. That's right, it has leaked and paints a pretty damn good picture for the new upcoming processor. But, as I said, first things first, Microsoft. So Windows 10 running on ARM is being touted by Microsoft to have an all-day battery life, and the ARM-based Snapdragon 835 chipset is going to be the processor of choice here. And we've already seen companies like Asus, HP, Lenovo uh, embracing this new design. But there are some issues with Windows 10 running on ARM. And these were discovered and then subsequently announced by Forrut.com. So first of all, x64 applications are not supported. So Windows 10 on ARM doesn't support emulation of x64 apps. There is talk that this might be supported in the future, but in the short term, not so much. Furthermore, only ARM x 64 drivers are supported. So while Windows 10 on ARM can run x86 apps, it can't run the drivers themselves. So being honest, this is probably not going to be an issue unless you're running like older devices, in which case driver support might be limited slash you might have to wait for an update from the vendor or just, well, probably buy a different device entirely. So you can almost think of Windows 10 on ARM to be slightly akin to Windows 10 S. Now this one's probably going to be more of a problem um, than the last one, and that is Windows which actually alters the UI or Windows experience may not function correctly. So for example, a shell extension, for example like Dropbox, might have issues. Now, eventually, they will be natively compiled, and by they, I mean, obviously, more applications will be natively compiled for the ARM processors, but that might mean that, in the beginning, you might have compatibility issues, which is going to make things rather interesting. Games and apps, similarly, might have some issues as well. Later versions of titles which use OpenGL 1.1 uh, or which need hardware accelerated OpenGL will not work on Windows 10 on ARM. So that means that, well, that's going to limit you somewhat. Furthermore, games which use anti-cheat mechanisms probably won't function well either. Being honest, this is probably not going to be a make or break after all. This is a low power device, so it's not like you're going to be playing, that's for the sake of argument, say, The Witcher 3 on this. But still, it will be an issue. Uh, especially for those who perhaps were planning to use it for more retro-friendly builds. With this said, Windows 9, sorry, um, DirectX 9, DirectX 10, 11, and 12 will function. So it's primarily older games and apps which work for older versions. So, for example, DX8 or prior or, old, or um, newer versions of OpenGL will be an issue. There's also no Hyper-V. Now, this was originally a great area... Um, and there was talk that said, well, it's Windows 10, so it will work, but no, apparently Hyper-V is definitely not working with ARM. So I think for the majority of Windows 10 users, ARM on Windows 10 should be rather interesting. It will support most applications and scenarios that probably Office workers and so on will use on a day-to-day -day basis, and more modern games that use DirectX 9 for sake of argument, they're going to be okay, especially ones which aren't technically demanding, so you'll be able to run them on a tablet. But for folks who were thinking this was going to be a great retro device to play DX8 games or older, or if you wanted to perhaps use x86 applications natively, then you might have some problems with this. 
Okay, next news story we're going to move on to is AMD releasing Ryzen V1000. Now, this is to compete with the Intel Gemini Lake. So, these leaks slash uh, rumors popped up on a website by the name of Advantech. And what we have here is a motherboard which shows a Ryzen embedded V1000 processor. In terms of performance, we don't know frequencies yet, but what we can tell you is it's got a 1 or 2 megabyte cache and the TDP lies between 12 and 54 watts. Now, it does share one similarity of the Ryzen 5 2400G in that it most likely will have a Vega GPU and probably 11 compute units are in this thing. And also we see a built-in I.O. chipset. In terms of display, we've got HDMI 2.0, one display port 1.4, and also a plethora of connection options, for example, a couple of USB 3.1s, a SATA 3, and also an M SATA as well, and of course the obligatory PCIe slot, although it's only running at 8 times, a mini PCIe socket, and finally an M uh, 2 dot. Uh, an M.2 M key, excuse me. And finally, we'll discuss the Ryzen 2600 because some benchmarks have leaked onto the internet. And this comes to us from Sysoft Sandra. So as we're probably aware, the Ryzen range of processors has been fairly successful and there are a plethora available for the mainstream. They go from four cores with only four threads up to eight cores, 16 threads, and they have been selling like hotcakes. But that's not to say that Intel have seen all AMD can offer. Therefore, to help face off against Coffee Lake, AMD are introducing the Ryzen 2000 series of processors. You can also refer to these as Zen Plus if you prefer. There have been leaks in the past of what we're going to be expecting from this, but finally we have a pretty decent indication in terms of performance. So thanks to some Geekbench results, we actually have an indication of what this processor in terms of clock speed might be putting out, and also performance scores. So let's jump in first of all to the performance side of things. Single core score is 4,269, multi-core score is 20,102. Now, before we dissect that, it's worth noting that this is with Geekbench 4.0.3, and it is a try, uh, the tryout version. Now, the upload date for this was January 25th of this year, so it's quite modern, only about two, three weeks old now. And the cache information looks identical to what we've seen previously. For example, we've got 16 megabytes of level 3 cache, 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache, a level 1 instruction cache of 32 kilobytes, obviously, uh, that's times 6, and finally level 1 data cache, 64 KB times 6. The base frequency for this is showing at 3.4 gigahertz, and if we read the name of the processor, we can see 3. Point, sorry, 38 slash 34, so that tells us that the turbo speed for this is about 3800 megahertz. Other things for us to take into consideration, we don't know how the BIOS is faring in terms of how updated it is, how optimized it is for Zen Plus, so perhaps there could be a slight tweak here or there. We also don't know memory clock speeds, timings, which could also, of course, drastically impact performance. But this is, for all intents and purposes, the 2600. This is most likely not the 2600 Plus, and we can also see that it's 6 core, 12 threads, so it's essentially the counterpart of the 1600. Now obviously your mileage will definitely vary, and you're probably going to be able to find results of the 1600 which are very close to the 2600 without any question. But even so, this is a good indication that AMD have certainly tweaked performance a considerable amount, and it looks like 5 to 10% improvement does look on the tables indeed. I say the tables because, well, there's a lot of tables for us to take into consideration. First of all, I would be very curious to know how much headroom there is left in the processor, how well it overclocks, and also how it will score across a wider gamut of benchmarks. At the end of the day, while Geekbench is a decent benchmark, there's nothing wrong with it, just like any benchmark ever, and this would 
be the same as if you were to look at, let's say, a Doom score, or whether it was um, Sysoft Sandra, CPU-Z. They're nice, but as we all know, one processor can sometimes do better in one application, and another processor can do better in another application. But from a general rule of thumb here, you're looking at about a 10% improvement over a 1600, which is pretty darn good. I've said before, and I'll say it again, to me, what I want to see is about 10% improvement uh, over the previous generation, and possibly with slightly better overclocking potential than the previous generation as well. If AMD can nail that, certainly I would say that Coffee Lake still would be a pretty spiffy processor for certain individuals. If gaming is a concern, if single thread performance is certainly a concern, then by all means, Coffee Lake might still be an excellent platform, especially if the Coffee Lake S rumors with the 8-core processor. I say rumors because at the end of the day, until Intel actually tell us that it's going to appear on store shelves, I'll be somewhat pessimistic. But still, even if those rumors do turn out to be true, I do think that the 2800 or 2800X, whatever they end up being called officially, of course, will be certainly a very compelling counter-argument. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.